Good afternoon or good morning, uh, everyone. I am Jim Hake, the founder and CEO at Spirit of America. And it is my great honor to host Dr. Corey Shockey today. Uh, Corey leads the foreign and defense policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute at AEI. And it is a uh, extraordinarily talented group of people over there that she leads, uh, helps, helped build since she arrived. And, and uh, the, some of the analysis that's being done over there is, is uh, that really uh, ranks among the world's best. So I got to know uh, Corey uh, after I read her book published in 2012, State of Disrepair. I read that, uh, it was at the recommendation of the then commander of the US Special Operations Command in Africa, who had it as the only book on his desk. Uh, <laughs> it was a, uh, a very thoughtful critique of the State Department by someone who knows how important the State Department is and wants it to be stronger. So although it's uh, 10 years old, I, I would recommend that to anyone. Corey is a brilliant thinker, uh, a very gifted leader and a deeply principled patriot. And she's also a member of Spirit of America's advisory board. Yes. And if you, uh, <laughs> thank you, Corey. And if you don't know uh, much about Spirit of America, we work alongside US troops and diplomats all over the world and provide private assistance in support of their missions. Essentially, we, we fill the gaps between what's needed to achieve and support US national security objectives, you know, the gaps between what's needed and what government can do. So you can think of us as bringing a kind of embedded uh, venture capital capability in support of America's values and, and national security objectives. Uh, one housekeeping note, uh, well, two, we will wrap up at uh, the top of the hour. And if you have questions, which I hope you will, please put them in the uh, Q&A uh, part of, the, of your Zoom toolbar, and we will uh, take it from there. So Dr. Shockey, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to see you. It's a treat, Jim. I'm such a fan of the work Spirit of America does. Well, th th thank you. Uh, with you know, with the, the complicated world in which we live um, and the pace of change, if you could start off with a, a bit of a, let's call it a state of the union from a national security perspective, what are you thinking about? What are you worried about? Um, and uh, we'll take it from there. Sure. So I think we should start with what I'm not worried about, which is the great good fortune Americans have as a country to have great neighbors in Canada and Mexico and two vast oceans, to have a global network of friends and allies to help share the burden of the things we're trying to do in the world, and an enormous number of countries that um, share the values that animate American democracy and America's role in the world. That's just fabulous. And if we actually had to force people to try and do what was in America's interest, it would be so much costlier and so much more dangerous. So the animating values that drive America to care about the world and to try and shape it in ways that increase our security and increase our prosperity are such an enormous advantage. And at the core of that is active civil society of the kind that Spirit of America represents, which is people motivated to try and help solve problems and to get together, organize and act. Um, I hope, incidentally, Jim, before in the course of this conversation, we will talk in particular about the work Spirit of America did in Ukraine uh, after 2014, but before the most recent Russian invasion, because it's extraordinary. But, 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 I will answer your question. What am I worried about? I am worried about the stinginess of our assistance to Ukraine not just American assistance, everybody's assistance, because we are so tentative and measured in our response that we are paying the cost of our reticence in Ukrainian lives and in destruction of their country and their economy. I wish we were doing more faster because it's really important that Russia lose this war. And it's really important that Russia's threats to expand the war and to cross the nuclear threshold do not affect the outcome of the war. Uh, you know, the 
the stability and prosperity that American dominance of the international order has brought since 1945 is one that has agreed rules that countries, for the most part, voluntarily opt into. And the core of those rules is that state boundaries only change by consent of parties, not by conquest. And Russia, with Chinese, Iranian, and North Korean support, is trying to create a new set of rules that will make things less stable, more dangerous, and less prosperous for us all. So that's the main thing I'm worried about at the moment. Two other things I'm worried about. Uh, the United States national security strategy that the Biden administration just outlined um, requires a lot more money to the Defense Department, the State Department, the Treasury and Commerce Department than the Biden administration budget allows. And we ought to worry more than we do about the gap between the ambitions of our strategy and what the administration and Congress are providing to resource it. Um, even as the third thing I'm worried about is mounting American national debt. It is such an exorbitant privilege that as the issuer of the holding currency, most trusted in the international order, we can run debts of the kind that we do, but we ought not to do it because we are encouraging alternatives that will diminish our power in the order. That's a great rundown. So I'm, I'm going to start at the top with a, a few questions about each of those three. So on the uh, question of Ukraine and our America support for Ukraine, what you, you said it was very, it was stingy. Um, what should it be? What should we be doing that we're not? And why do you think it is stingy? And what's, what are the costs of it being stingy? Where we want to start? There? Yeah, the costs of it being stingy is being paid in dead Ukrainians. As the Russian military becomes a decreasingly effective against the Ukrainian military, they are diverting their targeting to civilian populations, to power plants, to heat plant. What they are trying to do is a war crime. What they are doing is a war crime. What they are trying to do is to collapse Ukrainian will to defend their freedom. Uh, so, you know, September a year ago, uh, American policy was we couldn't give weapons to Ukraine because they would just end up in Russian hands when Ukraine lost so quickly. In December, we said, well, we, we can't give them offensive weapons, but we'll give them defensive weapons. Parenthetically, I like Jim Mattis's description that he's been shot at with both offensive and defensive weapons, and he can't really tell the difference. By March, we said, well, okay, we can give them offensive weapons, but none that could range Russian territory, because that would be destabilizing. By May, we said, well, we can give them, we're giving them weapons that range Russian territory, but they've promised us they're not going to use them to reach Russian territory. By August, uh, they were attacking Russian military targets in Crimea and beyond. And we said, well, of course, that's not Russian territory, that's Ukrainian territory. That expanse of a year as Ukraine held out and fought for their freedom against the Russian invasion is the cost of our timidity. And we predominantly weren't timid for Ukrainians, we were timid for risks we might be running. And I think given our strength and our role in the international order, we should have been less timid because I think the United States should always help people who are fighting for their freedom. And say again, uh, well, two things. You've served on the National Security Council and tell us a little bit about, help us understand how that policy, uh, this could take the, the rest of the day, I'm sure, but you know how that uh, you know, uncertain policy in some respects comes about? Or is it, you know, well, it, uh, it comes from the top in the Biden administration. You know, President Biden has said repeatedly, anxiously in public, we don't want World War III. 
and he has compared Russia's invasion of Ukraine to the Cuban Missile Crisis as the most dangerous Cold War moment of potential apocalypse. And neither of those are accurate descriptions of the risk the United States is running in our support for Ukraine. And incidentally, one of the reasons it's not comparable is we're not directly fighting in Ukraine. Second reason is because 49 other countries are assisting Ukraine. The Secretary of Defense holds a meeting every month in Germany at which 50 countries gather, including Ukraine, to identify their needs and how to match them with our support. And third, you know, the Soviet Union in 1962 uh, was leading a block of countries in the international order. We worried about the productivity of their economy and the attractiveness of their model. None of those things hold for modern Russia. We ought to be braver. We are the strong ones in this equation. And so with respect to modern Russia, could you say a, a bit about how we got here? Because the war didn't begin on February 24th. So give us a little background on that and, and what yeah. is in the thinking of uh, Putin. So since the end of the Cold War, the United States and its Western allies have tried to persuade Russia that they are safest and most prosperous if surrounded by countries that are likewise safe and prosperous. And we created the NATO-Russia Council. We, we reset the US-Russia relationship with every new administration. We tried to create opportunities for co cooperation uh, and stature for Russia. And it is just the case that that is not what this Russian government and maybe not even what the Russian people want for themselves, that they feel strong when they intimidate their neighbors, when they deny the humanity and the rights of their neighbors. Um, and this began to be evident as early as 2007 with Vladimir Putin's speech at the Munich Security Conference in which he decried the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. So World War II didn't make the cut, the Holocaust didn't make the cut, the, the peaceful collapse of Soviet control of states that did not want to be Soviet was his big concern. And in 2008, the invasion of Georgia, you've seen destabilization attempts along Russia's periphery. The international order Russia wants is where countries strong enough to uh, take what they want have the right to do so. And that's just not an international order the United States is ever gonna support. We are gonna work against the success of that. And that has been an increasing realization on the part of American governments that we have to. And where, how does this end? This ends with Russia's army driven out of Ukraine. It probably also ends with challenges to Russian control of Moldova, of Belarus, and other places on Russia's periphery uh, in which Russian military power and intelligence act activities have prevented people from being able to elect and install governments that represent their interests. And what will it take to achieve that outcome? And if those things happen, what's your crystal ball on when that might uh, come about? Well, it is occurring because the Ukrainian military is winning the war for its freedom, for the sovereignty of the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine. Uh, Russia is being slowly pushed out of Ukraine's territory. I think it'll probably happen in the east and the south. Crimea will be the last piece of Ukrainian territory that Russia can hold. But I, at the pace the Ukrainians are innovating, that we are arming and assisting them, it, my guess would be by next summer, we will be toasting an independent Ukraine 
and the defeat of a Russia that attempted to prey on its neighbors. Well, uh, Corey, when that happy day comes, I will be the first person at your office with a bottle of whatever to uh, us. <laughs> uh, we should go yeah. drink it outside the Ukrainian embassy in Washington, Jim. Yeah, at, well, uh, Ambassador Marco River would love that, I'm sure. Um, and, and one of our future spotlights is with another advisory board member, Ben Hodges, General Fabulous. Ben Hodges, fired. But hey, uh, this is a good moment to talk about Spirit of America's work in Ukraine, won't you please? Well, I'll just say a couple of words and I have a, more questions for you, but uh, we've been, since the war began, well, we started in Ukraine in 2014, provided a lot of assistance 2014, 15, and 16. One of the most important uh, efforts that we put forward was a uh, radio station, Ukraine's first armed forces media property called Army FM. And the purpose of that, and this was when uh, Jeff Pyatt was the US ambassador uh, to Ukraine, and his main concerns were America's support for the Ukrainian armed forces, and countering or having an answer for Russian propaganda and misinformation. And the first target of that misinformation were Ukrainian soldiers fighting in the East, fighting the Donbass, and they were bombarded by everything from text messages, phone calls to, to every other form of media. So Army FM was to meet their information and entertainment needs, get them where they were relatively isolated in the Eastern part of the country, but connected back to the rest of the country. And it has worked beautifully. Uh, we got it, we provided the support to get it started. It's Ukrainian operated. It's now operated by the Ministry of Defense. And it's a uh, signal has expanded uh, from three transmitters that we started with to 40 that the Ukrainians have put together. So we visited that just a couple of weeks ago when our team was over there. But since February 24th, we've been focused on providing non-lethal assistance to Ukrainian uh, forces and the territorial defense forces, you know, the civilian volunteers or people, you know, perhaps uh, younger than the two of us, but you know, Ukrainians uh, from you know, different walks of life who take up arms to defend the country. So that's been everything from uh, you know, initially ballistic helmets and bulletproof vests and first aid kits, vehicles, uh, night vision, and, and so on, all to help Ukraine win the fight that you say is so important. Uh, we're doing some other things of a more humanitarian nature too, but uh, my job here is to ask you questions. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, but but uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, you uh, visited Ukraine in, in September, I think, right? And uh, what yeah. were your uh, impressions? So I had four really strong impressions. The first was the outstanding courage of the Ukrainian people. I talked to the president, to the defense leaders, to business leaders, to civil society groups. And I was struck at how how everyone gave me the same answer. You know, my nightmare is that as Ukraine drives the Russian army out of Ukraine, that Vladimir Putin attempts to cover, camouflage that humiliation by using a nuclear weapon on the capital of Kiev in order to be able to claim that he had changed the regime and accomplished his war aims to a person when when Ukrainians face that that threat, their response is it won't change the outcome of the war. And I would hope that our own country would have that kind of courage under fire because it's extraordinary. And uh, so that was my first impression. My second impression uh, was just how good the Ukrainian military is and how endearing it is that they uh, model themselves in many ways on the American military. I'll just give you one fingerprint of it. When I was talking to the head of strategy and policy, I asked him, what's the most important thing you have right in this war that the Russians can't do? And you, of course, Jim, know the air power theorist, John Boyd, and his framework for thinking about how to observe, orient, decide, and act tactically. Uh, you know, in the military, they call it the OODA loop. And, and this Ukrainian general said, we are inside the Russian OODA loop. And it was a perfect fingerprint, both of how much we and they are thinking alike and learning from each other, but also uh, how adaptive Ukraine has been and how brilliant at the fundamentals of acting faster and more effectively than your adversary in war. Yeah, well, it's just, I, 
that, that's an awesome uh, set of observations. And the what it, it in many ways is to me is an expression of a free society where people start to figure things out and do things all in alignment uh, to an overall goal. And it, so it's, that's, it's a beautiful thing to see. That was my third observation. You know, this 17 year old kid uh, who figures out how to use his drone for targeting the way the Ukrainian government figured out how to help people identify where Russian units are. I remember Ernest May, the great Harvard historian and member of the 9-11 Commission, telling me in 2002 that the biggest mistake the United States government was making was telling people to just go about their business, the government can handle this, instead of energizing civil society to help shoulder the burden of solving these problems. And that's what the Ukrainians are doing. And my fourth and final observation, President Zelensky is every bit as good as he seems. Smart, um, earnest, soulful, committed to the good of his country. It's such a beautiful testament to human potential that you know a comedian could become the best wartime leader since Winston Churchill. Yeah. Okay, we're, we'll shift gears for a moment. And uh, uh, what's your, so let's put it this way, on, on a scale of one to 10, what is the threat of the uh, People's Republic of China, or maybe better put the, the Chinese Communist Party to the United States and the, and the world order? Uh, I would put it at about a five, which is a high ranking for me. Um, uh, but, but I'd like to cast the question slightly differently, which is, you know, the United States is, and its allies are gearing up for the problems of a successful China, a China whose economy is stampeding towards uh, overtaking the United States, a China that's an effective world actor whose Belt and Road Initiative is creating infrastructure that's gonna shift trade patterns and rise, uh, contribute to the rise of developing countries. We begin to get ready for that China. And that's actually no longer the China we're looking at. We are looking at a China of two to 3% growth, marooned in the middle income trap. Per capita GDP is the equivalent of Mexico's per capita GDP. The Belt and Road Initiative has not only not produced the shift in trade patterns, it has made China the world's largest lender to, to projects that no Western financial institution would have given because they can never be profitable. Uh, and so we should be a lot more worried about the problems of a stalling or failing China and the stridency of the nationalism that the government is attempting to engender as a substitute for a bargain about prosperity. And, and that's a great point. And what problems do you think are likely to grow out of that? Uh, much greater aggression. I think I do think we should be worried for the sovereignty of Taiwan. Uh, I think um, uh, efforts to try and lock in advantages that if they had continued to rise would have been available to them. Uh, you know, it seems to me the most dangerous countries in the international order are not countries that are rising because they have a positive future. They can play for time because things are getting better. It's stalled and stalling countries because uh, they have aspirations that are going to make them embittered when they cannot achieve them. And that's where I think we are with China. And that, that's uh, part of what, of course, we're saying with Russia, too. Absolutely. They will try and get jobs in international institutions in order to prevent the effectiveness of those institutions or shift the rules in ways advantageous to China and Russia, but not others. Uh, a lot of that kind of insidious behavior. And what do you think will happen with China and Taiwan? And I know there's been great discussion at AEI. Uh, you know, you hosted a terrific event with uh, uh, Hal Brands and Michael Beckley and Derek Scissors. Some you know great uh, disagreements and discussions there. Not as many disagreements as uh, it might have seemed. But 
So what's your what's your forecast on what's likely to happen with Taiwan? So as you rightly say, we are having a bare knuckled brawl on the third floor of the American Enterprise Institute about China's future. Derek Scissors and Oriana Schuyler Mastro are of the view that although the Chinese economy has stalled, they will continue to stall and still be marginally successful for another 30 years or so. So there's no urgency to the risks China poses. And their behavior internationally is uh, activating antibodies against their continued success. On the other side of the argument, Hal Brands and Michael Beckley are of the view that China's economy stalling will lead to, um, you know, historically the aggressiveness of stalling powers is what Hal and Michael are worried about. And therefore they think there will be a near-term military threat to Taiwan. And the Director of National Intelligence and the Director of Central Intelligence, Avril Haines and Bill Burns, are of Hal and Michael's opinion, believing that the window of maximum vulnerability is between now and 2027, which makes Biden administration policy uh, deficient for two in two ways. First, because they are cutting people and platforms out of the American military between now and 2035 in order to usher in a vague promise of more advanced forces in 2035. So long past the window of maximum vulnerability. And the second deficiency of Biden administration policy towards China is that they have no international economic policy and America's allies, particularly in Asia, are pleading for us to come up with a strategy that helps all of our countries reduce our reliance on China and the Biden administration just can't do it. Well, we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, what do you think the likelihood of, a, of an invasion of Taiwan is by China? And uh, if that happens, what do you think the U.S. should do? I, I'd say the odds are three in 10. It's very difficult to make an amphibious landing across 100 miles of rough seas. Uh, and uh, we in the Taiwanese are working hard to complicate what that would be, what what that invasion would look like or a blockade. And we in the Taiwanese have an enormous number of tools available to us to complicate and hopefully deter that. So I think only three in 10 is the likelihood. But the more confident China grows that they might succeed, and the more we wring our hands and worry about whether we could or should assist Taiwan, um, the more encouragement those voices in the Chinese government arguing we need to do this and we need to do it soon, the more the more amplification that has. Yeah, interesting. And and should um... oh, I'm sorry. And what should we do? Yes, I think the United States should always be on the side of countries fighting for their freedom. And Taiwan is such a vibrant democracy that they deserve our help, they deserve our support. We should be thinking of creative ways to make uh, them stronger and more independent uh, and assist them in protecting their sovereignty. Well, I am, our, our team has been active there for about a, a year now and I'm headed over on Saturday and- uh, Great. You might be able to do and uh, we'll be getting your advice on uh, the plans that shape up uh, very soon. But, uh, I look forward to hearing about it. Yeah, I, I uh, we're very, very uh, focused there. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I wish we had more time, of course. Hope to see you soon, long before we uh, get the toes in front of uh, Ukraine's uh, embassy. Of Ukraine's embassy. Uh, and for everyone else that tuned in, you know, one of the things we're doing here with Spirit of America is bringing some of the great intellects and thinking of people who are part of our community, Dr. Uh, Shockey is a bright, shining example of that, and also to provide some context for what Spirit of America is doing and why. Uh, but Corey, thank you so much for being with us, and uh, see you soon. Really appreciate it. It's a great pleasure, my friend. I'm a huge supporter of Spirit of America's work. Thank you.